Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today's episode, again, is just a little bit different. It's a keynote speech I did at the FTTC 2023, the fire truck training conference that was held in Lansing, Michigan, sponsored by Spartan Motors, and of course, their parent, the Rev Group. Uh, I was asked to come in and take part in the conference. A lot of what we do in the fire services discuss apparatus. We work with a lot of different manufacturers, the Rev Group included, and they asked us to come in and be a part of the process. Uh, and part of that is giving the keynote address for the opening night at the opening uh, dinner. And I was honored to do that to a room of almost 350. And I got the chance to talk about myself, the platform, where we started, where we are today. And then, of course, the back half of that is talking about the status of affairs when it comes to fire apparatus in the country. Um, this group of 350 are people that are there to continue their education, trying to get their certifications to become a master emergency vehicle technician and EVT, as well as uh, learning new products, taking new courses and being better than they ever could have been before. Uh, and that means working on our apparatus to make sure that we get to where we need to be when we need to be there for the public that we serve. And so it was an excellent glimpse into what takes place all week there. We were only there for a few days, uh, myself and a few guys from the team. Uh, but we captured the keynote, and I wanted to share that with all of you. I think there's some good tidbits in there towards the second half of it where I talk about this state of affairs and the things that the guys in fleet services and the shops really deal with on a daily basis. Sometimes we take for granted what they do for us, and so this keynote's a shout-out to them and the skills and abilities they bring to the table. So anyway, thanks for tuning in. And again, this is the keynote from the FTTC 2023 Rev Group Fire Truck Training Conference. Slide on the board, bubble gum and duct tape. Always being asked to do more with less. And so being able to speak here tonight, we've done some projects in the past with Rev Group, um, an unbelievable group of partners. And so they asked me to come tonight and to do a keynote while you guys enjoy your meals after a long day of testing and training. And so I want to give you a little background about myself, my story, and then I'm going to talk about what you guys do. And as a firefighter, I'm going to give you all the praise in the world for what you guys do every single day, because without you, we don't get to get out on the street and do what we do. And so real quick, the first slide is Aloha. Uh, two weeks ago, I absolutely I had a wonderful opportunity to go to Maui, Hawaii and document firsthand the fires that occurred there in Lahaina, Maui. It was an overwhelming experience, very powerful experience for me, my family, my videographer that I brought with me. We sat down, we interviewed 22 people in four days for our podcast and social media platform. You see, I didn't like what I was seeing in Hawaii. I didn't like seeing the fires that had occurred and a lot of the mistruths, the tinfoil hat news that was coming out of there. Firefighters have a duty to protect one another. And I was watching some of the stories and they were falling back on the firefighters in Maui. And I didn't like what I was seeing. And so the beautiful thing about what I do is I get to have a network of friends all over the country, all over the world for that sake. And so I'm gonna get into what National Fire Radio is in a minute, but I want you to understand that the brotherhood and sisterhood runs very deep. And so I made one phone call which put me in touch with another gentleman. And before you know it, within two weeks time, I'm on a plane going to Maui, Hawaii to document the fires. Sat down with 22 people, firefighters, retired firefighters, cultural leaders, civic leaders, politicians, you name it. And we got a lot of unbelievable stories. Everything from the first in engine companies, first in brush companies, everything from the people that set up the pods, the point of distribution. We had an unbelievable time there. And what I wanna stress, and the only reason I bring this up tonight, is because it had such a profound impact on me and I wanted to share that with you. The aloha spirit, it's not just hello and goodbye in, in Hawaii. It is a way of life, it's a spirit. And I learned that while I was there, the culture, the heritage, how important position and place and order is in their community needs to come back to our full society. We're losing track, we're walking with our heads down instead of our heads up these days. We need to start looking around and look at the mission, look at the people, look at our friends, brothers, sisters, and families, and everybody around us, and take care of your neighbor. We're losing track of that. The Hawaiian culture really had grounded me on that trip, and it really made me think very long and hard about the way things are and the way we're trending. There's a lot of parallels between the Hawaiian culture 
in the fire service. And that's what I loved about that story. And so it was a very profound experience for me, my family. I shared it with my children and my wife. I wanted them to see firsthand what I do outside in National Fire Radio when we're out in the streets talking with people and getting the real stories. And so over the next few months, we're going to be releasing these podcasts, these episodes um, for consumption. And they are moving, they are deep, um, and they are profound. So I just wanted to share that with you. But we're going to go on a little journey tonight. I'm going to share a little story about myself. Um, where I come from, what my background is, why I'm here tonight, and then I'm going to talk about you guys for the rest of it and talk about how wonderful you guys are and what you do for us in the fire service. Of course, you can't do it without the partners, the relationships, obviously, Rev Group and all of their brands. I'm going to wander because I hate standing on stage, and nobody likes to sit up front, so now I get to go out this way. So the partners, right? We can't do it without the partners, the sponsors. Over the next few days, there'll be other manufacturers here, and obviously, they're all part of it. They're all part of the equation. Not only are they vendors that you buy from, you buy their products, you put them on your apparatus, you use them in your firehouses and everything else, but there also needs to be partners and relationships in place so that you can trust them and that they can trust you. So it's very important. So a week like this here, not only are you getting your certs and your training, but you're also developing relationships and I challenge you all to get out and speak with the sponsors and the different brands that are here. It's super important. Family's everything. It's a family business for me, and this is one of several family businesses that I'm a part of. That's my father, 81 years old, in the volunteer firehouse. He's, he's everything to me. Um, he has given me so much in life. He's taught me about life. He's taught me the way I need to be, how to treat people, how to talk to people. And so he's my everything. And I usually get sappy about this, and I'm not tonight, and I don't know why. But I usually get a little emotional because he's my everything, and one day he's not going to be here. And so every second I get, I share a picture with him in every keynote that I do. I share a picture of him because he's very special to me, but it's a family business. The fire service is such an incredible institution. And I believe all of you, or most of you, were a part of that family. That's important. It's something you should cherish, something you should be very proud of to be a part of. My other family business was... I was a ball bearing salesman. It's a freaking punchline, right? You go to cocktail parties, people are like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I sell ball bearings. Now, you guys should know what bearings are. You know power transmission, mechanical. I was on the industrial side. It was a family business, 42 years in business. I'm a technical salesman. Belts, chains, sprockets, pulleys, couplings, gearboxes, pumps, motors. This is my life. Outside of the firehouse, I became a technical salesman. I'm 46 years old. And in that industry, I'm one of the youngest guys around that have the knowledge and experience that I have because it's an older gentleman's industry. And just like you guys were having a hard time filling the positions within, we're finding a hard time finding people that could turn a wrench. We're having a hard time finding people that have any technical experience or common sense for that matter. It's becoming an issue. It is an issue. When I grew up in the family business, I was one of three boys, and my father owned the company. I'm the youngest of three boys. My other two brothers are firemen as well, and they also were a part of the family business. Well, I'm the youngest of three boys, but I was in charge. I was the go-getter. I was the guy that ran the family business. But I have to tell you, it wasn't always easy for me, and I'll tell you why. That was me. Anybody not familiar with... Big Tom Callahan, Callahan Auto Parts, Tommy Callahan. Okay. I was Tommy boy. Fat, drunk, and stupid. Came out of college. I had life, I had life by the cojones, man. Life was good. My father brought me into the family business. Now, during college, I had the opportunity to get hired twice as a career fireman, and I deferred it both times. Because I did feel a sense of obligation back to my parents, back to my father, for the education he provided. See, I was one of the lucky ones. I grew up in an upper middle class neighborhood. My parents took care of my college education. And I feel like I squandered it away. So the one thing I had to do was graduate. So I didn't take the career fire job at that time because I felt that I owed them. At least I felt something. And so I did. I finished college, I deferred the fire jobs. And I came out of college, and what do I do? I go into the family business. My father, with open arms, welcomes me in. He says, here's a car. Here's a credit card. Go see clients. Go learn the business. I did a lot of lunches. I did a lot of golf. Didn't learn the business. 
I didn't learn jack shit, excuse my language. I was Tommy boy. In 2008, 2009, there was a big correction in the economy. I came into work one day, my father says, here's the deal, you're gonna sit behind a desk and learn this business or you're fired. It's a moment. That day, I had to let three people go in the family business because I wanted to stay. But those three people ran circles around me. So now what do you do? I couldn't be unemployed. I should have been. My father should have threw my ass out. But instead, he believed in me. He gave me a chance. We had to downsize the family business. We had to let people go. And I had to actually learn the job. And I did. And I learned it well. And I went all in. And it was important to me. And that was that moment where I knew I belonged there at that time. I knew I belonged there. And, uh, and so we grew the business. And as I learned the product, got my hands dirty, rolled up my sleeves, worked the parts counter. Guys are coming in with dirty axles, dirty drives, you name it, man. I'm breaking it down. We're identifying parts, no part numbers, all of it. I mean, alignment, vibration, calipers, like this is all stuff that I've learned over my tenure. And I, I continue to do it today. Outside of all of this, I still do it for another company. But then I started getting tired of it. I felt that it wasn't my passion. I became successful at it. I was very good at it. We were growing the business. I started finding other opportunities how to grow the business. I started making it current. I started going to Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and I started educating not just our region, but America, the world, about what we knew. And the business kept coming in. See, when you take advantage of platforms that are new, current, and where people are digesting content, they're gonna come. And so that's got me thinking about my true passion, firefighting. The family business was a family business, but it was my father's business. And the problem is, is as you build a business in the family, as the second generation, it's typically not fair. Anybody familiar with family businesses? Awful, awful. I'll tell you why. I loved every second of it, but it's that conundrum. It's an amazing thing, but there's also other potentials. I stopped having barbecues with my family. We stopped hanging out outside of work. You start to have conflict. There's friction. You don't see eye to eye. The youngest son, me, is in charge. I have two older brothers that have to answer to me. That doesn't go over well. And so these are all things that started adding up, and there started to become this level of resentment. Resentment is a terrible thing. And so it was time for a change. I turned 40 years old. I looked at my wife and I said, I'm not overly happy anymore. The job's good, the career's been good, it's given us a good life. I'm content, the kids are healthy. She's a beautiful wife, she's a wonderful wife, great mother, things are good. But I wasn't feeling fulfilled. I just wasn't, I needed a change. And so right about that time, I was like, I think I want to go all in on the fire service. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to take what I learned with the bearing business, and I'm going to roll that into the fire service. We're going to start delivering the message on the platforms that people are paying attention to. Because here's the deal. At the end of the day, the landscape's changing. It's 100% changing. So magazines, newspapers, print ad, not as common as it once was the attention shifted. And I learned that through my personal business. And so through my personal business, I said, I think I could take this methodology, put it to the fire service, put an authentic spin on it, start telling stories about the senior man, protecting the integrity of the job. Because what I was watching in the fire service was this. The senior man was getting pissed off and disgruntled at the job. 25, 30, 35 years in, he leaves angry at the job and takes everything he learned with him. Nothing stays. It doesn't get passed on. It doesn't go to the young guys. He takes it with him. 25 years of an incredible career. The last five years, he's pissed off the new guys. There's a communication gap. He hates the administration. The administration's taking, pushing back. All these different things. And the same guy that was there 20, for the last 25 years is now a very different person. And he leaves the job, and he's known as a disgruntled, angry senior man that left the job. I didn't want that to happen. I knew too many guys that are too valuable that have an incredible message and experience to share, and the fire service is all about experience, knowledge, passing it on, just like being mechanics, guys that work in shops. It's important. 
And so for me, I wanted to capture those stories in perpetuity, and that's exactly what we did with the podcast. From there, things started blowing up pretty quick for us. So National Fire Radio was started six years ago. We're a podcast and social media platform. We're on every channel across the board. Some are stronger than others. Um, it was very important to me from day one to be totally authentic. Firefighters call bullshit real quick. That flag gets thrown very fast, and they move on, and you never gain back your credibility. So there's never embellishment. There's always the promotion of the job and pushing the job forward. And when I talk about the job, it's firefighting, whether volunteer career, paid on call, doesn't matter. It's the same job, the fire doesn't care. So wherever you sit on that, and I know there's a lot of variation in this room tonight, um, just talking with a couple guys that are coming from all over, all different types, from very large metropolitan cities to the smallest of towns, you guys still have to maintain fire apparatus. So it doesn't matter where you come from, the frequency in which, and a lot of times, the smaller shops have a harder time than the bigger shops. The bigger shops typically have more resources. So it's that balance. So National Fire Radio, capturing the traditions and culture of the fire service. That's what it's all about for me. My partners, Jim O'Connell, Rob Ridley, Sebastian Rolo, and I got a bunch of other guys at home that help out with the platform. That was me in Hawaii a couple weeks ago doing an interview. That's a captain of Engine 11. They were one of the first in engine companies in Lahaina town at that fire. They were lucky to be alive. They're lucky to be here today. They had several engine companies get overrun with fire that was consuming at such a rate that they couldn't get out of those neighborhoods. They were watching people being incinerated in the streets. It was a horrible situation there. Hurricane off the coast, sustained winds, gusts up to 80 to 100 miles an hour. It was a firestorm that they were totally outgunned because if you're a fireman on an island, you only got X amount of resources. Me, I'm from New Jersey. We could have the biggest fire in the world, and I could just keep calling resources, and they're coming, right? You could throw people, you could throw equipment at it. There, they didn't stand a chance. They got overrun. For me, it's all about community. We created a platform that promotes the job, and then as the community builds, we get to take certain permissions. We can start dipping our toes in other waters. And so what I was watching with the fire service was, and how I got involved with the apparatus industry, was I'm an apparatus nerd. Love fire trucks, always have. And so we started finding ways that we could start educating the public about building fire apparatus, custom fire apparatus. We do something with our tips, tricks, and hacks. So this is on Instagram, it's on Facebook too. We get hundreds of thousands of views like every single day on this stuff. We are sharing the tips, tricks, and hacks, and this is something we do called Apparatus Innovations, and it's hashtag Apparatus Innovations. So if you search that on social media, you'll see thousands of posts. And what we do, and what we found out very quickly was, how they do it in California is different than Kentucky, than New Jersey, than Florida. And in New Jersey, I'm looking for, high five, thank you. So in New Jersey, I'm looking for a solution to something, and you guys already figured it out somewhere else in the world. Why not share it? See, the fire service is all about that. It's supporting one another. It's picking one another up and sharing ideas, the experience, the knowledge. Why do I have to go searching for an answer if it already exists? The problem was there was no platform to share it. We created that platform. So our apparatus innovation is something that I'm very proud of. And in fact, we're building this out on a much bigger scale that we're gonna be delivering probably second half of this year, which will revolutionize the way fire trucks are being built. And I mean that with the utmost confidence. See, every single day, manufacturers, distributors, end users, backstep firemen, officers, guys in the shops, they're texting me, calling me, sending me DMs. Do you have more pictures of this? I saw this. You guys did a video on this. You talked about this. Can you share more information? See, what's really cool, you guys are here because you need the training, you're, you're uh, researching, you're getting your credits, or you just wanna learn more. See, for me, when I watch guys that come to conferences, it's because they wanna be there typically. That's fun because this room's full of people that wanna be here. And so that means you're the guys that are picking up that phone and calling. You're the one sending a direct message on Instagram or Facebook saying, hey, I wanna learn more, educate me. That's pretty cool, because those are the people I wanna surround myself with, people that wanna push this job forward. So I'm gonna give you a quick story right here. This is a small little scene light. Typically it's a brow light. You guys know this on the side body or in the front. This department decided to mount it down on the front left in front of the driver's side door, the chauffeur door, and there's one on the, on the officer's side too. It's got a, a, like a quick toggle up in the cab. 
And we're walking the factory. We saw this, and, and nobody knew why that was there. It was the first time I ever saw that. Rob and I are out at the bar that night. We like to do a couple pops when the night's all said and done. And we see the guys with the T-shirt from that truck. Same name. And Rob goes, those are the guys. So we go over, and we're like, hey, guys, we saw your build, beautiful engine, nice work. We've got to ask you a question. What is this? And I bring it, up, bring it up on our phone. We go, what's this picture? And they go, well, we're, we're in Mississippi, and we have long driveways. And all the mailboxes, just traditional, have, like, copper mailboxes. The addresses are very hard to see at night. And the, the, the mailboxes sit off the gully, so it's like country road, there's like a gully or a culvert ditch, and then the mailbox in the driveway. And so the driver has the ability, so does the officer, to quick toggle those lights on and off as they're passing mailboxes. It's something regional. They've been doing it for 50 years down there. Never heard of that before. We posted that. That thing went gangbusters, just to give you an example. It's something simple, something that was regional to them. I can't even tell you how many hundreds of trucks have that on it today. See, we get to share that, and the fire service is all about that. We get to share what we've learned. And if you're willing to do that, if you're all in on this job, and you're willing to share what you've learned, you pass it on to the junior man, you're the senior mechanic, you're the fire officer, you're a battalion chief, whatever you are, this job is meant to pass it on. And so that's what we're doing. National Fire Radio loves the shops. I live in the shops. See, we travel. I'm the luckiest guy in the world now because I get to travel all over the continental United States, Hawaii. I'm hoping to get outside of the country. We have contacts for that. We just haven't gotten the trips together yet. But one of the most favorite places I go when we go to any city is I go right to the shops. I love the shops. The guys in the shops are going to tell you the way it is. The guys in the shops are the most creative and most important guys in the fire department. I firmly believe you guys are the most important division within the fire department. You allow guys like me to go to fires. You allow us to do our job, and you typically do that at any cost, meaning duct tape and bubble gum. It's the title of this keynote. It's getting the job done so we can serve the public that we're sworn to protect. Boss's position to have huge favor for the shop guys, I like reading that one, because it's true, man. How many how many lieutenants, captains, chiefs come down, shake hands, bring donuts, and if they don't, start stonewalling them a little bit. Maybe they'll start bringing you some treats. But I know, I've seen it firsthand. They come down, they're like, hey, Jimmy, uh, you know, you got, that, you got that light, remember? You know, I brought those donuts last week. You know, you got that, yeah, yeah, here's an extra bulb, whatever. That's how it works, right? Scratch my back, you scratch yours. It's those informal relationships. That's the fun part about what we do. It's building relationships. Whatever it takes, I talked about it, duct tape and bubble gum, whatever it takes, we rely on you. It's not just the firefighters. I don't care if the seat's broken. I don't care if the vanity stuff is a mess. I care if I can flow water, raise ladders, put fire out, and help the public. What's that? There it is. I, I got so many things I can say to that. So here's the thing, right? A lot of guys get spoiled. A lot of places. And it's funny, uh, depending on where you go. The bigger the city, typically the equipment gets used a lot more. It's, it gets ridden pretty hard, right? In more suburban and rural communities, the equipment's in typically much better shape. It's just a fact of life. It's usage, right? But we get spoiled sometimes that we want more, we think we need more, but at the end of the day, the only thing we need are pieces that get us to jobs and we can make a difference to the public we're sworn to protect. That's it. You guys know who that is? Yeah. Anybody watch? I love MacGyver growing up. This guy's genius, man. Duct tape, tic tacs, battery, you know, jumper cables. The guy can make like a time bomb, right? That's what you guys do. I've seen it firsthand. You get creative. When you're so good at your job, you can find ways around it because there's a lot of issues these days. There's a lot of issues these days. And we're going to get into some of those issues that are affecting you guys on a daily basis. So I was just talking about this before. I jumped ahead a little bit on the slide. All these pictures are pictures I've taken. Um, so different shops that I've been to. That's in Stamford, Connecticut. They're replacing the engine on Tower 2. I believe they drove through a train trestle that had like six feet of water under it and swamped the truck out. And there you go. New apparatus, let's talk about that. Everybody loves new apparatus. The only problem is we can't get them. 
right? And I don't mean that. That's not a shot. That's just reality right now. We got longer lead times, right? But I'm curious about you guys. How involved are you in your department's process? See, it's easy to get a committee together, whether you're a volunteer fire department, you get all these guys together and everybody knows every little detail. Meanwhile, nobody's a diesel mechanic. Nobody knows generators. Nobody knows transmissions, right? But they, but they know because their buddy told them, this is better, you want this, you gotta get this, we need this because we have some hills. Where do you guys come into the equation? We need you in the spec writing. We need your input because you guys are the ones that have the experience and knowledge on the equipment we respond on. So it's important to get you into the process. Pre-construction and final inspection. So pre-construction, are you a part of the development? How important is the input to the committee? What do they value more? Do they value the flashing lights? Or do they value the gearing, the braking, the auxiliary braking, the power plant lights, right? Typically, right? So we need to refocus, right? Now guys, if you guys wanna, I love interaction, so please feel free to talk off the floor. I love it. But that's the thing, mechanicals, operations, vanity. What's most important? How do we prioritize new builds? That's where you guys need to be in the process. We need you in the process because a lot of times the build gets skewed on the vanity metrics. Operations takes the back seat, mechanicals take a back seat because we want this truck. Well, this day and age, it's getting harder and harder to do. Final inspection, where do you fit in the process? Do you travel to the plants? Does your department do pre-inspection, pre, pre uh, you know, the, the prints, pre-construction? Do you guys do pre-construction at the factory? Is it virtual? Do you not get involved in pre-construction? I know departments that don't do pre-construction meetings. They get their prints, the spec, they bid, it's done. Build them. I can tell you pre-construction is probably some of the most important meetings you'll have because you'll always find things, and I'm sure most of you would agree if you've ever been through that process. Final inspection, a little too late sometimes. So this is where I think it's important that we get you involved. At least I believe that, and I think most of you would too. Delivery status, like I said, longer deliveries on new apparatus, what are your options? Well, you guys are now responsible for holding stuff together longer. Were you laughing? Somebody laugh? I thought somebody laughed. But it's true. Refurbish, secondary market, the tertiary market. You have to look at options. Things have changed. The landscape's changing when apparatus are going out 36, 48 months. What's the plan? Because here's the thing, right? Administrators are like, man, the trucks are going out. You know, we're not going to get that new engine for 36 months. Are they talking to you at the shop level to say, what does that look like? Because that apparatus that's due to be replaced probably needed to be replaced three years sooner. And now you guys have to hold that thing together more and more. And so what does that do? You got to make decisions. And that's the time and where we are now, right? So that's Hartford. That's uh, Hartford, Connecticut's old tactical, they don't, it's a rescue, it's a heavy rescue, but they call it a tactical unit. It's one of the busiest heavy rescue companies in the country, believe it or not, Hartford, Connecticut. So I think they do between 25 and 30 runs a day, typically on that rig. So if so, we need to maintain our fleets longer, costs more money, right? We have our budgets, and, and we're gonna get into costs in a few minutes, but we have our budgets, and we do our budget planning. Are we accounting for prolonging the life of apparatus that need to be retired? Does management and administration understand that? No, no, they don't. Supply chain issues. How many people are having problems getting sensors, axles, brakes, you name it? I mean, the whole room hand, it should be the whole room. It's happening everywhere, not only that, but inflation, right? Inflation. So the prices are going way up too. So your budgets are getting thrown out the window. And you're coming in red and you're beg, borrowing, cheating and stealing to keep your apparatus on the road for guys like me. And we appreciate that, trust me, we do. So apparatus, I mean I've seen, I've been to the shops, I talked about going to the shops. I've been to shops where there's apparatus lined up outside and they're all sitting there waiting for something can't put it back on the road because of a recall. They can't put it back on the road because they're missing a, 
an aerial sensor. They can't put it back on the road because they're missing filters. Whatever it is, the apparatus, viable apparatus, are sitting there in idle while you have reserve pieces that are falling apart out in the streets still. It's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. We're not scrapping trucks like we used to. I mean, maybe you guys are. But see, what's happening is as the market is getting longer and longer, you guys are scavenging for parts. It's MacGyver. So if you got a couple of retired rigs that are coming off the line, you're probably pushing them in back of the yard. And then you're like, hey, Joe, go grab that whatever. Go grab that handle. Go grab that seat. Grab that rear door. Does it sound familiar? Yeah. So you guys are being asked to do more with less. Um, I just want to make sure I hit every bullet on that. Cost, budget busters, everything is more expensive, inflation, even PMs, if you even can get to your PMs. Everybody loves scheduled PMs. Are they reality? Are they happening at the frequency in which they should? Are you hitting your targets? Probably not. Not any fault of yours. It's a combination of parts, time, lack of people. The list goes on and on. Trust me, I understand. A lot of people understand what's happening in our shops. We understand. What we need to do is educate the administration and educate our sales reps and the vendors and the people we work with about the problems, the consistency and problems that you guys are having and the struggles that you face every single day. The long lead times, it's creative, or it's crazy, and you guys have to get creative. The other thing too, I have capital purchases. I don't know the type of departments. Again, there's such a range here. But like I know my department, we have a, like a revolving capital purchase plan for apparatus, for replacement. And every X amount of years, we're scheduled for replacement. Well, that obviously gets thrown right out the window when I can't get delivery. So now your capital planning gets thrown off. And so this is where those meetings with administration, the bosses, the penny pinchers, this matters. Typically, though, it's going on deaf ears. It's challenging more than ever. And I can understand the frustration level. That's probably on most of the shop managers' minds every single day. Preventative maintenance, talked about that before. Um, PM for new apparatus, so part of the pre-construction being a part of the specs, super important, right? Give yourself access. If you guys aren't a part of the process and you guys are doing the PMs and all the labor and work on these trucks every single day, we want to give you the best access possible, but that might have to be specced into it. And firefighters, average firefighters, chiefs, they might not have that knowledge or experience to do so. And so that's another very important part of the process is if you guys are involved from the early stages. I can't stress that enough how important that is. Working together. So this is a picture I took at a show down in Raleigh. So that's a Virginia truck. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a tower ladder. And um, I don't know why they chose that design, but they made a custom swing out bracket for the queue um, to allow for the cab tilt. I don't know why they couldn't recess it in the grill or the bumper has some, you know, obviously the down riggers and then the, you know, the middle trough, you know, there's a compartment there. So I understand why it's not in the bumper. Maybe they could put it in a grill. I'm not here to second guess their design. What I am here to talk to you about, again, is those apparatus innovations. This was something that they had designed at the factory to allow for the use of a Q siren, but also allow for the ease of tilting the cab. I've never seen this design before. I've seen others that fold, but never this like swing out panel like that. I've seen them fold forward and so on, but it's just a, a little bit different of a design, but it's something that has to be thought of, right? It allows access for the cab tilt. It's just something simple, but it needs to be talked about. So working together matters. Um, do you, <laughs> so this is fun. So walk-in rescue story, right? You guys can read the slide. I don't need to keep reading them to you. The walk-in rescue story, let me give you, let me give you a quick story. So we have the, Tomorrow, I believe we're going to the Spartan plant, and we get to, you know, this is the cool thing about what I get to do. I get to go look underneath the covers, man. You know, it's cool. I get to go to these factories. I get to interview people. I get to talk to people. I get to learn about the industry from the inside out, and then we get to share that with all of you. So if you follow our content or you know who we are, whatever, however that looks, you'll get the same look that we do and the same information that we get. So the walk and rescue store, we're at a manufacturer, 
and uh, I'm talking to their rescue specialist. This guy, I build rescue trucks all over the country. It's my job. I'm the rescue guy. And I'm like, it's cool. I go, how many times have you gone out and ridden on them? You guys hear that silence? That's the same silence I heard, right? The rescue specialist, but he's never gone to a fire. He's never been to a structural fire, a diving incident, a trench rescue, a confined space, rope rescue. He's never been in the back of that thing running to a call, lights and sirens, just bouncing on busy streets. He's never been in the back of a walk-in rescue truck. And they have rescue trucks in every, so many major cities. So I was like, well, why don't you become part of the process? Why don't you get some of that buy-in? Because the guys that are going to tell you what's wrong with your truck are those guys. See, when they deliver these trucks, they come to the shop. You guys do your once over at the shop. You do your radio installs. You do whatever you do, right? However advanced your shop is, not right? You guys have your thing. Trucks available. Company comes down. They dump the cachet over. They swap over. New rescues and service. Whoop, whoop, let's go. Within three weeks, the handle's ripped off. This seat's got a rip in it already. They don't mount the tools where they originally thought they should go or where the factory put the mounts. They don't put the flashlights and the chargers because they're out of reach or they don't belong there. This is the important buy-in that I'm talking about. Those guys, the, the, the rescue truck salesman, the rescue truck specialist, if he would only go out and live with those firemen for three shifts, three days, whatever, three 24s, live in a firehouse, learn their culture, and see how they respond. He's going to learn real quick that the bench seat in the back gets in the way every time they get in and out. So they're going to cut that to a 45 and not a 90. They're going to realize that this grab handle doesn't belong here because every time they get out, their halogen or their hook gets caught up on it or their SCBA straps. Right? Those are those simple things. But you've got to have buy-in, and this is where relationships matter with manufacturers, with your sales reps. And you guys at the shops have that ability to develop those relationships. And I can't challenge you enough to invite them in and talk to them like a friend and not a business partner. Tell them what you do. Tell them what you expect from them. Give them expectations. I learned very, on, very early on in business, and I do it in the firehouse. You can't ask somebody for something if you don't give them the expectations of what's expected. So tell your vendors that. But that buy-in story of the rescue special, it's hilarious to me. This guy's a rescue specialist and has never been into a structural fire in the back of a rescue truck. It's a whole different game. So I challenge you guys, get involved like that. Maybe you guys, if you guys are of the mechanic of the department, maybe go out and ride with those guys for a 12-hour 12, 12 tour. Go to the busy house, jump in with them. Ask if you can go live with them for a 24-hour tour. See if your supervisor, your boss will let you do that. You're going to get a much better understanding of how they treat those trucks, how they run those trucks. You're going to find out who treats them well. You're going to find out who runs them into the ground. But you're going to find out those little nuances so that you can get the buy-in. You start to own it. You take ownership of those trucks, but you've got to know how they're being handled and worked on. Company pride. You guys have the ability to do this in the shops. You have the ability. I'm seeing a lot. It's pretty cool, right? So in the northeast where I am, there's a lot of old history there. So you get a lot of company pride, individual pride. I understand other parts of the country, the fire districts are expanding so fast that the buildings look like hospitals. There's no character. It's just an institution. It's a building with fire trucks, and we just put people there every single day. There's no pride in ownership that a lot of other firehouses typically have. And I understand that. And that is a dilemma within the American Fire Service. I recognize that. I talk to guys every single day day about that topic. But you guys down at the shops might be able to do some little things just to bring some company pride to that company. Or if they come down and ask you, hey, can we do this or can we do that? And it's probably on your list of things to do, but you have 10,000 other things to do. It could go a very long way with that company if you throw them a bone or do something a little bit special. It's pretty cool. And they're going to hook you back. I can guarantee that. Company pride's important. Add pride to your ride. Buy, um, Box Alarm Grills is just a friend of mine. They make like custom mud flaps and numbers on the grill. And Jobtown Graphics, that's one of the logos they did for Buffalo uh, 38 engine. So it's just like little things like that that can go a very long way. This is something we did, which is kind of funny. Um, I knew it would get traction because we go back, I think the guys over here, when I talked about vanity, and he's like, yep, vanity, that's what they want, sirens and lights. 
So like two years ago, I founded Stanford, Connecticut. It's a career department, um, an expanding career department. So they have their downtown companies. I think they got like eight, comp eight stations downtown. And then the, the town of Stanford is being developed very quickly. And the volunteer service, like most places, is starting to dwindle. So they're starting to expand out. And the, and the career companies are starting to take over more of the volunteer landscape. We have a duty to do. We have to provide the correct fire protection medical protection for people that believe in us. And so we don't have a choice when it comes to that. So they, they are big into the company pride within their, within their individual Stanford companies. And so the guys at the shop showed me a, a, a cue siren that they just put a strip of LED lighting. And so whatever engine company or truck company it is, whatever color they are, they just, you know, if they have a few seconds, they'll, th they'll throw, it's like a $30 LED strip in there and they just run the power and whatever. It's done, right? So I was like, that's really cool. It's something different I never saw it before. This just talks to the traction of just sharing something, right? We shared it on our YouTube video. It's a quick YouTube video, I don't know, 10 minutes long, 12 minutes long on how to do it. And it exploded. I got hundreds and hundreds of pictures from trucks all over the country that have them now. And I'm like, that's cool. We influenced that. My point is that that's a vanity metric. I recognize that. It's non-functional. It's not important in the grand scheme of things does have that company pride sense of value. But the reason why I mention it, and the reason why I bring it up tonight, it shows the influence in which we have. Not just us, but all of you. You guys can have the same influence within your own department, your own shop. Share your knowledge, share your experience, share some things you've done. Shine a light on yourselves, promote yourselves, and it's not peacocking. It's telling people how important you are within the department, because like I said before, you guys are the most important division, and I firmly believe that, in the firehouse, in the fire service. Impossible to find people these days, would everybody agree? A lot of shops have vacancies, can't find guys, can't find guys to turn wrenches, can't find electricians, can't find building maintenance people, you name it, right? The list goes up on and on. I'm having the same problem in my sector. I, we can't find motor rewinders, pump mechanics, we can't find vibration and, and uh, coupling alignment specialists. We can't find any of that stuff anymore. It's getting harder and harder. I have, just to give you a little information, like on the electric motor side that I deal with still outside of all the fire service stuff I do, because I moonlight, we sold our family business and I work as a technical salesman for the company that purchased us. And so I, I manage like one account for them. Uh, it's a big account and um, does very well, but Electric motors, you got 82-year-old men rewinding motors. Copper, repacking the motors, rewinding motors. 82 years old, they're making massive six-figure salaries because we need them. It's incredible. If I could grab kids and educate them to become an apprentice in the electric motor field, it takes like 10 to 15 years to really learn the trade. And then when you do, you can name your price. It's one of those jobs, and I firmly believe that the hands-on, common-sense, blue-collar jobs are going to be coming back stronger than ever. I firmly believe that. They have to. And I know there's this disconnect, this younger generation. God, they're terrible, aren't they? I don't know. They're just different. We have to figure out. We have to find our ways to communicate with them, too. We're not right all the time. They're not right all the time. I do another program called Bridging the Gap where I talk about the generational gaps between young and old. And that was a lot of the foundation which National Fire Radio was built on. Because a lot of those guys that were leaving the job that I referred to earlier pissed off and disgruntled was because they were frustrated with working with the new generation. These guys, they ask why. They're asking questions. They're not as tough as I was. They're not as, you know, it's just, stop. So I do a program on that too where I talk about bridging the gap between generational values and so on. And so I get that very well because I'm one of those guys in the firehouse that takes the old guy and the young guy and I put them together and I go, you two need to talk. Because I think he's got an incredible story, you have an incredible story, you guys need to learn how to work together. So you're not getting up from this table until you guys share a story and maybe, you know, hug it out. I don't know, but it's important. Doing more with less, I talked about it. You guys don't have a choice, right? We have a job to do. We gotta go put fires out. We gotta go help people. We're sworn to protect the public. So we don't have a choice. It's just the way it goes. It's bubble gum and duct tape. You guys are holding together your departments. 
now more so than ever. I believe that. I've seen it firsthand with the travel that I do. This is a slide I like to pop up. I talk about it all the time because in the fire service, when we talk about complacency and comfort, that's when guys die. You take for granted your training. You take for granted. I've been doing this a long time. I've been a fireman for 28 years. Um, you take for granted one day, and that could be the day. Too often we get comfortable. Comfort leads to complacency. Complacency leads to death. This slide here, I talk about the fast lane. Um, I took this out of one of my other programs, and I've been incorporating this into every keynote that I do now. I've been doing a couple different types of keynotes for different groups and organizations. I like to tailor them to the group that I'm talking to because that's how you get buy-in, right? The fast lane, so often we get very comfortable in that fast lane and we do our speed and we just maintain our speed in the fast lane. We don't even keep, we're not even looking in the mirror anymore. I know in New Jersey that if you don't get out of the fast lane, we are blowing past you on the right-hand side. That's how we drive in New Jersey. I do the New Jersey Turnpike literally almost every day. And if I'm doing under 88 miles an hour, I'm slow. It's fact. I got out here today. We landed at Grand Rapids, drove over here. I'm, I'm cruising a minivan. I got a minivan for the next four days. It's pretty cool. Soccer mom car. And uh, we're cruising on the highway. And I'm like, this guy in the left lane, he's like doing like 77. I'm like, he's going seven miles over the speed limit. I was like, well, come on, man. Like, let's go. This is the lifestyle I live. That's that New Jersey hustle. We don't slow down. My point is this, though. You have to be aware. If you stay in that left lane and you stay comfortable and complacent and you're cruising at 77, I promise you somebody's going to pass you on the right and you're not even going to see them coming. I use that slide in almost all my keynotes because I think it brings tremendous value and it paints a picture about life. Let's not get complacent, whether in job, in your family, at home, in the firehouse. Complacency kills. Kills marriages kills relationships with children, can kill firemen, can kill your career. So I talk about that in every keynote that I do for the most part. I think it's a powerful message. And lastly, because I don't want to talk a year off, I could talk all night and I can see how you guys have fallen asleep or I'm kidding. But I appreciate all of you, you guys have been incredible tonight, but responsibility. We all need to do our part to make the fire service better. I firmly believe that I'm a student of the American fire service. It has given me incredible Incredible opportunities, friendships, brotherhood, sisterhood. And I can't be more thankful that I was raised in the firehouse and my father did that for me. So I challenge all of you because I believe in it, so I hope you do too. I hope that while you're here this week doing your training and testing that you work as hard as you can to be the best mechanic, the best supervisor, the best firefighter, or whatever other position you have. Challenge yourself to be the best at it. And then go infect somebody with that. Go tell somebody about this week Go home and get two more guys to come back with you next year. When we do fire training, that's what we talk about. We go to these conferences and all we want to do, we come back from a weekend of training and we have this conference hangover. We're flying high. It was like, we're getting dirty, we're doing firework. At night, we're sharing pops, we're telling stories, giving hugs, laughing, crying, meeting new friends from all over the country. It's the best thing in the world. And then you go home and the same six a-holes are like, who cares that you went away this weekend and, and wanted to be better in the fire service? Like, I don't care. It's our job. Don't let those people bring you down. You cannot let those people bring you down. And I don't care if you're a fireman, a soccer mom, a chef, a banker. Be proud of who you are and what you do and infect somebody to come back with you. So when you go home from this next year, bring two more people back. Explain to them why this is important. And when you're back at the work and you're back at the job and you have all the frustrations that I talked about in this keynote, don't let it get you down. I know it's hard. Find somebody you can lean on. Find a buddy. Find a guy that gets it. That's what this is about. Network. Go meet guys from other cities that do the same job or a different job than you. Befriend them. Talk to them. Visit them. And become lifelong friends because those are the ones that will pick you up when you're down. Since I started National Fire Radio six years ago, I have the best friends in the world the best friends in the world. That started at 40 years old. I thought I was complete at 40. I'm just starting. And so guys, thank you very much for tonight. My contact information, I'm here until Wednesday morning. You guys want to chat, you want to talk, whatever, I'm here. 
But I appreciate all of you being here. Ashley and the crew from Rev Group and Spartan ER, thank you very much for having me. Gentlemen and ladies, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.